Okay, so you've just heard the uh, recording message. This talk is going to be recorded, but the discussion afterwards is not going to be recorded. So we have here with us today, Deirdre Nihanila. Deirdre Nihanila is a musician, broadcaster, and writer from the Aran Islands. And we've just heard that, that she's not on the Aran Islands, but looking out to the Aran Islands at the moment. Um, Deirdre has held a number of postdoctoral fellowships in recent years, including an NUI postdoctoral fellowship in Irish and Celtic studies and an Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellowship at NUI Galway, an Alan Lomax fellowship uh, in folk life studies at the Library of Congress, and an NEH Kyo fellowship at the University of Notre Dame. She coordinates the community-based project Auron Aaron, uh, Aaron Songs, and her monograph Collecting Music in the Aran Islands, A Century of History and Practice, will be published by the University of Wisconsin Press in summer 2021. And I am really eager to see this. She also has a number of exciting, excellent articles to her name concerning Irish song and song collecting that I have absolutely used in my own research. I got to know Deirdre, I think, when she consulted on a project here at Harvard that I was also involved in, and this was the restoration of the rediscovered Robert Flaherty film, Eichia Hanachish. Uh, we were on a couple of really fun, I think, discussion panels for that project, and I know Deirdre yeah. was instrumental in essentially repatriating the film to the Aran Islands to show it there for what I think is the first time. Is that correct, Deirdre? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the first time. So the actors were from the Aran Islands and next to no one from the islands had ever seen it because it had never been shown there. Deirdre's present research concerns the untold story of the cultural lives of Irish speaking immigrants in 19th and 20th century North America and the potential of digital humanities to enable creative access to the rich archive of Irish music and folkloric material that survives on both sides of the Atlantic. And I believe she's going to talk about something along these lines today in her lecture, which is titled, The Reverend Daniel J. Murphy Archive, Reconfiguring the Cultural History of Irish Speakers in the 19th and 20th centuries. So let's please welcome Deirdre with our, with our little clapping icons or our actual hands. <laughs> Hello everyone. Uh Gramina Maya Natasha Asotum uh um, um yes you're right. Uh, we were uh, working together on that wonderful panel that we had back in 2015 I think uh, in Harvard um for Ike Hanrich, uh the first Irish language talkie made in 1934. And uh, I think that was the last time I was in Boston as well for the snowpocalypse as it was at the time. So uh, we seem to have dramatic contexts when we're coming together. Uh, and um, I'm delighted uh, to be invited to uh, share this story with uh, this audience. And I'm delighted as well to know that in the audience, there are many uh, friends I've uh, met along the way and also uh, descendants of some of the people who will feature in the story I'm going to tell you today. So uh, you're all very welcome in uh, Colorado and Pennsylvania in particular. And uh, I'm going to share my slides here. Hopefully now they will work. And you'll see them here. Good, okay, there we go. So as Natasha said, um, I'm a musician and a scholar. I play the fiddle and I research Irish traditional music and both of these practices inform and enrich each other. And the common theme of all of that work is uh, voices. So I work to source voices, uh, whether they're in communities or in archives, and I help to generate platforms for them and then to enable co uh, connection uh, between communities and their own memory, uh, in a sense. So um, that's often called uh, maybe restoration or repatriation, which is what was happening with Ike Hanachish and bringing the film back to the island. 
and um, it's always a pleasure to be involved in uh, projects like these, uh, whether as a, as a musician or as a scholar, it's, uh, uh, it's um, life affirming, uh, I should say. So uh, this um, work has led uh, most recently to the book that Natasha mentioned, uh, which is um, going to be released by the University of Wisconsin Press um, in around July, I believe. And um, the, uh, all of the archives that I worked with inspired the uh, discussion that's in this uh, book. So um, we have, uh, it's, it's really about the practice of music collecting in Ireland and features four collections from the Ireland. So um, uh, the, um, with th that history, uh, in a sense, we're, what I was learning from it was one particular observation I wanted to include uh, today is that um, history, in general history, uh, often fails to consider cultural sources and uh, those lacunae multiply in respect of intangible cultural heritage such as music because of the essentially ephemeral nature of music um, that it's fleeting and that it, it sort of has to be grasped or captured in some way uh, but there's also the question of access to the media to capture it so that media includes literacy as well as technology writing and recording so and um, this um, I suppose interface uh, is what I've been studying and you could call it in short where music media and memory merge and I'm interested in both the methods and the motives of those who are documenting music. Now, the uh, risks I've uh, highlighted there um, for music uh, being maybe forgotten or marginalized even, uh, they arise also for minoritized languages uh, that may have relied on uh, oral transmission and or also have had uh, relatively uh, limited practices of literacy uh, and, and another um, threshold is that of diaspora uh, because as both music and language rely on contexts to survive and thrive diaspora presents another variety of threshold for uh, cultural practice to cross distances of time and space and I just uh, found this image uh, recently um, and uh, it, it, it was a way to show how music might have been written down. There's, there are many images of music being recorded with the, the technology, sort of the, the wonder of the machine, uh, maybe drawing the eye of the photographer. But here's just a, a scene from um, 1916, 17 or 18 or so of Cecil Sharp, the English music collector and his collaborator Maud Carpelys working together in the Appalachians writing down songs and the basis of course the, the foundation on which their work was uh, based is that uh, that the songs would have survived uh, in the diaspora that uh, songs that were coming uh, from the old world uh, into the new contexts so um, the story I'll be sharing with you today uh, relates to uh, the Reverend Murphy collection it's an archive of Irish language song manuscripts um, that span the late 19th and early 20th century that were produced by and among the Irish in America. Now, this archive demonstrates a scale of detailed evidence and of language practice that is uh, unprecedented. And uh, we're coming to understand that Father Murphy and his collaborator, uh, JJ Lyons, and I'll be introducing them both uh, presently, uh, really that they are major collectors of Irish language song as this would appear to be the largest collection produced by independent uh, collectors uh, that would have been uh, sort of independent of any institution, any formal institution um, for which the work was being done, if you see what I mean. It, it was uh, the impetus came from themselves and from the communities around them. Now this collection has remained unknown for a long time uh, for reasons that will become clear uh, as I go along. But for those of you who have some um, understanding of um, maybe Irish heritage collections in uh, the US in particular, um, 
the shorthand we can use is that uh, Father Murphy is the Chief O'Neill of Shannon's Song. And uh, I'll uh, explain a little bit more about uh, Chief O'Neill uh, in, in a minute. So, um, but he's, he, he, they're not working alone. This was something I wanted to emphasize today. I, I'm talking about Father Murphy and his collaborator, JJ Lyons, but um, there are others who are uh, working with the Irish language who are accessing media, uh, whether it's literacy or, um, the, or the print industry to uh, engage with Irish language practice in their new uh, homes. So it's not, um, their activity isn't isolated is the point. It's part of a network of Irish language practice that spanned uh, the Americas and the Atlantic world. And they called that setting, that diasporic setting, uh, an American in particular, they called it Ada War, meaning big Ireland. So that gives us some sense of the, uh, I suppose the scale of the ambition as well and the context in which they imagined themselves uh, to be working. Um, so it, it does speak to a particular conviction in respect of Irish language heritage and of um, uh, sort of bringing that with them and um, that it's an active practice. And uh, the image you'll recognize is that I've used on the cover of the book is actually from an artwork entitled Carrying the Songs. And uh, that's uh, a tribute to Moya Cannon's poem of the same title in which uh, she uh, talks about uh, migrant uh, migrants um, everywhere really she, she's um, talking about but the line at the heart of the poem says songs were their souls currency the pure metal of their hearts so it's just to get to the idea of um, the uh, sense of purpose that helped to sustain uh, the memory of these songs uh, through time and space, you know, coming from Ireland and then through their lives uh, in, in America. And that the songs were helping them to, that performing them and singing them and, and living with them were helping them to counter the effects of displacement and dispossession. So, uh, Father Murphy. <laughs> um, I said that uh, it's the the work that he's producing is on a in line with or on a parallel with um, Chief O'Neill. So uh, just because I know his is a very um, famous example, um, I'll just explain why I'm comparing uh, the two of them. One is in terms of uh, scale, um, because uh, Chief O'Neill collected um, in partnership with uh, Sergeant James O'Neill. There's no relation. They collected around 1,800 uh, tunes of instrumental music, but not song. So, you know, between them, they had the ability to transcribe music, but not so much familiarity with Irish. So song really is, isn't, doesn't feature for them. So it's like a, a nice butterfly effect in a way to then have the Murphy collection that sort of um, takes, it, takes it up on, on the other side to look at the, the songs instead. So um, they're contemporaneous as well, I, I should say, because we have Father Murphy working from around 1884, same as Chief O'Neill. And where O'Neill stops around 1908 or so for personal reasons, uh, Father Murphy's work extends into the 1920s. So um, his collection has over 1,200 Shano song titles in it. And there could be up to 20 versions of some of those songs. So, um, the, uh, the scale is the one is the first point of comparison between them. Um, but the, the one important difference between them would be the fact that uh, Father Murphy's collection is arguably um, more detailed. Um, there's a, a lot of detail, for instance, uh, the maiden names of some of the uh, married women um, singers, including their uh, home parishes in Ireland, as well as the US addresses for where they're living at a given time. And um, all of the, when we look at the timing of this, as I say, 1880s onwards, and oftentimes they're looking to older people who uh, would have held songs as well, would have many in their memories. We're talking about the pre-famine memory of Ireland because they're the people who are in the States by the 1880s and 90s and who might be on in years. Uh, 
a lot of them would be famine survivors uh, having come from Ireland and brought with them uh, their own uh, memories. So um, this map that I'm showing you here is um, uh, really it's a it's a sketch, an early sketch. This is where I was first trying to get a sense of the uh, geographical distribution of the singers that feature in the collection. And uh, what's uh, interesting about uh, this is that I'd like to highlight is that um, all those pins on the map, they're from different counties in Ireland. And uh, that uh, it, it makes it very different collecting experience for any of the collectors uh, back in Ireland, because um, you wouldn't have the same, you might have a concentration in a given location, but to get a Donegal singer, a male singer, Galway, Clare, Kerry, all, all of these counties featuring um, in one geographical location, it's the diasporic setting that's going to generate that opportunity. So that's a really interesting distinction when we're looking at uh, collections of this nature produced in a diasporic uh, setting. And then the other um, uh, aspect of this particular collection that's uh, worth noting is that is Father Murphy's own position in society, him being a priest. It's a position of authority uh, in the community. So he has some degree of access to people. Um, and uh, also uh, he might not be questioned as much uh, given the moral authority associated with that role. And also given that um, over half, I think it, uh, over half of the collection is uh, women singers, um, which uh, that gender ratio doesn't always uh, appear in uh, collections from a later period. Um, but there would have been no issue with a priest visiting a woman in her own house while her husband was out at work uh, during the day, um, him to spend hours there maybe transcribing songs. So uh, just interesting uh, features or factors that uh, enabled this collection to um, emerge in, in, in its form, its current form. So um, one question might be, what is prompting all of this collecting and, and writing down? Um, it's important to note that um, literacy in Irish in the 19th century is comparatively rare when we look at the size of the population coming out of Ireland. Irish wasn't on the school curriculum in Ireland until 1904, I believe. So for someone to be literate in Irish and maybe also be a, a native Irish speaker or at least a fluent Irish speaker, that's pretty rare um, to begin with. And uh, the other issue is well, first of having that ability, but then the outlets, if you're able to write down or, or, or even read Irish, where are you going to access it? Um, we're, we're not seeing song collections until much later, the 1890s or 1900s onwards. And this is from the year of the formation of the Gaelic League back in Ireland, 1893. And even some of um, Douglas Hyde's uh, publication material had appeared earlier in newspaper form. So in other words, you know, I mentioned accessing um, material in a given language or, or it, it be musical material, that challenge uh, is significant. And it's one of the reasons why this uh, manuscript activity, which of course harks back to the manuscript tradition in Ireland, um, uh, how it seems to survive. It, you know, it, it has the feel of being a, a remnant of that manuscript tradition in Ireland um, uh, coming into, uh, into the States. And of course, there are scattered throughout um, the United States um, examples of manuscripts that were brought from Ireland over to America. So where's Father Murphy from? Uh, County Sligo, born in Kilmactig in 1858. And um, I've been very lucky to be able to connect with um, his extended family who have shared a lot of information uh, with me, including this photograph. So um, that has been uh, really such a like a turbo boost for the research in trying to trace um, the, the pieces. And uh, he's one of 10 children and uh, they're all nearly all of them emigrated. It's, it's sort of the, the classic uh, story. One stays at home on the farm and eight of them emigrated. Uh, then the, the other one as well had died in, in mysterious circumstances uh, back at home. But uh, I, I'll just point you to the house, uh, the homestead there that you'll see in, in the bottom right. 
um, that's the, the Murphy homestead in Kilmactaig. And uh, just to explain that the, um, the main road that's passing by in front of the house is leading into the local market town of Eclare. And just at the far gable, um, which you can't quite see, but the far gable, there's a, a boreen going up the mountain there, up into the Ox Mountains. And uh, the family tell me that uh, this was a bilingual house, that the people passing by the front door on the way into, into the market were speaking in English, but the people coming down the mountainside and coming in through the back door would have been speaking in Irish. So giving us a sense of the language shift that's happening uh, in Ireland uh, in the post-famine period. So as I say, they emigrate. Um, uh, a lot of them are end up in Pittsburgh. I think James ends up in New Jersey and Father Dan ends up in uh, Philadelphia. And just last night, actually, um, I was in touch with some family members and um, you know, the question of why would Dan immigrate, you know, what was uh, the incentive there? Um, it, he had an uncle who was uh, based in Pennsylvania before who was a priest. And so um, this could well be the, the reason why fa Father Dan, as he would become Donal, uh, ended up going to the seminary uh, in Philadelphia or in Overbrook just outside uh, Philadelphia. Um, so his uncle was the Reverend Thomas Marin, and there were other priests in the Marin family as well. And he uh, was a priest for uh, around 30 years. He was a parish priest um, in rural Pennsylvania. Um, and I'll touch on that when I get to that part in a minute. Um, but just to show you this uh, image that we have here, the uh, writing that you're seeing behind the image of the seminary is a letter that uh, Dan wrote um, uh, to Ungail, um, a journal, uh, a bilingual journal that was being published in Brooklyn in New York. And uh, as you can see, he's having fun with the place names because for Overbrook, he has translated it into Fall Har Fro, uh, being a direct translation of uh, Overbrook. And uh, he is sending a song to Ungail. Um, and this is sort of early evidence of him already at this stage that he's in the seminary, but he's already engaging with um, a certain amount of uh, scholarship. And uh, I have a reference uh, somewhere where he was explaining what would have prompted his uh, move into the seminary. And he wrote, he said, Go why my gideen skoige at Olus, which translates as that I might grip knowledge by the throat. So that gives you a sense of um, maybe the, the, his personality. Um, I wouldn't say he was one to mince his words. Um, so just to give you some sense of uh, Philadelphia that he arrived into, he would have emigrated around the mid 1880s. And by that time, the 1890s, yeah, we figures for then, there's an estimated 400,000 Irish speakers in America and uh, an estimated 40,000 Irish speakers in Philadelphia by 1899. So um, a lot of Irish and Father Murphy uh, by 1890 at the latest, he's a member of the Philocaltic Society of Philadelphia. So uh, around, around 1886 or so, the society had around 80 members. And uh, just there's a description here from Ungail where uh, the secretary John Robinson wrote, um, that the, it's comprised of nearly 80 members, from children of seven to old men, all either reading or conversing in the language of their forefathers. So um, for, the, for the younger ones, it is about language acquisition, but um, I imagine that for the older ones, it's about uh, the acquisition of literacy in their own language, and maybe to enable letter writing home, et cetera. So uh, there's lots of scholarship um, on that phenomenon. Uh, so, we have, um, again, going back to Ungail, uh, here, uh, Ungail and the Philocaltic Society of Philadelphia were actually found or founded or launched in the same year of 1881. And we're fortunate that the minute book um, from the Philadelphia's Phil Philocaltic Society survives amid Father Murphy's papers, um, which are now in NUI Galway. And that's not surprising, I suppose, because the position he held in the society was at one point a librarian. Uh, and he also was collecting um, various numbers and editions of uh, Ungail. 
so much so that there is a near complete series, the most complete series held uh, in any institution is now in, in NUI Galway. And uh, really these, um, between the society and that network of the journal, the readership and the, the contributors, et cetera, this is the, um, this is the community of speakers and singers and correspondents that Murphy has entered uh, in arriving over to America. And uh, I've just I've just given you a glimpse there of maybe um, what's happening in an urban setting in Philadelphia. But of course, um, uh, this collection relates also to rural Pennsylvania. So here's just an image from um, the northeastern Pennsylvania coal hills there. And he is in Auden Reed in Carbon County uh, by 1886. We can see Donald O'Murrow here and we only know for sure that it's him because of course it's his own copy of Ungail that he has been adding marginalia to over the years and sometimes correcting the editor's corrections. <laughs> um, and uh, it, this is a letter that he's uh, writing again. And it's just uh, that a glimpse into the emigrants um, cool, you know, missing home. But uh, I'm, I'm interested uh, given the news I got last night because it would appear that Auden Reed is where his uncle was uh, a parish priest at this time. Uh, by 1886, he would have been there for nearly 20 years. So it looks like this is a uh, summertime, maybe a break from the seminary and he's up to visit his uncle and his sister who was um, a housekeeper uh, in the house in Auden Reed as well. So, um, uh, the, we, you know, in this area of uh, Pennsylvania, there's evidence um, at various times, and it can be very difficult to trace evidence of uh, Irish language uh, practice or use, but we've glimpses here and there, uh, for instance, um, of Catholic clergy. So there's a reference to Carbondale in Pennsylvania that uh, it was nicknamed uh, Connacht or Connacht because of the, the numbers of Irish speakers there. Um, and naming Father O'Shaughnessy and Father Prendergast being the, the ones to read Sunday Mass through Irish. Another reference, um, I think it's from um, Clive Solish or something, I can't remember the, where it is sourced now, but uh, that there was a young priest who listened to 500 confessions a Gaelge. Um, and, you know, whether there's a, a bit of hyperbole there with the numbers, uh, still it's quite significant that there would have been um, enough of a demand, enough of a a community of Irish speakers there to uh, to warrant uh, that uh, need, the demand. And uh, we're seeing by the time um, uh, Father Murphy is here, um, he's connecting with Irish speakers around him and he's, he's meeting them. And uh, th it's this network that uh, introduces him to uh, his friend JJ Lyons. So JJ Lyons is from Glenamady in County Galway. And you're seeing on screen here an example of uh, his penmanship. So um, we've got the Gaelge script uh, above and the uh, English language uh, below. And he's, um, he's transcribing songs and submitting them to uh, John Glynn, who's the editor of the Gaelic column in the Toom News back in Ireland. Toom, of course, being maybe the, the biggest local town for Glenamady. So um, significant that Lyons is, is connecting with um, which is ar arguably a local paper back at home in Ireland, but the Chum News is, is a pretty significant um, uh, organ for this particular practice in any case, because it's one of the earliest with the Gaelic column in Ireland anyway. But, um, but I'm pointing to just this example of his penmanship because it gives us a glimpse maybe into the level of literacy or literacies um, bilingually that JJ had um, leaving Ireland perhaps. And uh, here we have a photograph and I have uh, John Young to thank for this. It is his great grandfather. I've got all my greats right. Um, who is uh, Luke Comer. And he was the school teacher in Stone Town uh, near Glenamady. And that's, uh, this was JJ's school teacher. And uh, the, there is um, a little reference from a little bit later where uh, JJ and his brother have emigrated and the brother goes into the office of Ungail uh, in New York to order a subscription to send back to their old teacher uh, back in Glenamady. So um, it, very interesting to see the, the, uh, 
I suppose the connections there and maybe the sense of uh, appreciation for uh, that um, capacity that they were able to um, write back and, and share Irish language practice with their old teacher, but that they're uh, in Philadelphia and New York uh, between them. Uh, and uh, the, the, there's an interesting context for this question of um, education in Irish or through Irish or literacy in Irish, especially in relation to this part of the country, because Glenamady and Stonetown would be in the Diocese of Tume. And in uh, 1840s Ireland, when the National Schools Act was brought in, the Archbishop of Tume um, uh, resisted it on the grounds that schools would be non-denominational. And this, of course, was a threat to his control of his diocese and of the schools. So it raises a question, um, what if, if, if these schools had a degree of liberty, perhaps, in terms of the subjects they were um, teaching, uh, given that they were not under the national school system. And the pins on the map are pointing to um, individuals that are part of this network of Irish language practice in the 19th century, uh, whether they're collectors um, or they're publishing or, or, or teachers. And it just, it struck me that they were scattered throughout this diocese. So it's difficult to trace uh, these kinds of, um, I suppose, hints. Uh, but it still is an interesting uh, question. Um, some of the people that I'm tagging here would include Michael J. Logan, the editor and founder of Ungueil, the, the bilingual journal in Brooklyn, uh, John Glynn, the editor in, for the Chewham News, uh, John Hannan and MJ Lovern as well, who, who ended up in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. So just an interesting question to bear in mind. Um, here's a letter that uh, Father Murphy would have uh, sent to JJ and um, they're corresponding while he's in the seminary and at that time seminaries the, the life would have been uh, quite restrictive so the sentence that I've underlined here he says so uh, this big bare house is not quite a paradise um, but they're obviously um, you know becoming uh, friends or and uh, confidants and we have a, a letter that um, JJ is sending to John Glynn um, introducing some material no doubt that he's um, sent and seeking subscriptions etc but he says this is a young priest from County Sligo he's a great scholar of Irish and if he lives I believe no other scholar in this country will be as good as him he and I are very friendly the Mahin Sahin on war how he says it in Irish uh, so um, they're uh, really the relationship between them would appear to be that of the master and the apprentice, that JJ is a bit older and that he's, he's certainly collecting by 1884 and uh, they're collaborating. And uh, we're seeing uh, JJ just collecting here an example of maybe some of the people he's encountering. He's, he's written this in Philadelphia from the recitation of Patrick Flesk, a young boy who landed here lately from Clare Galway in uh, County Galway. Um, and that's Dubu Nabrati is, is what he's collected there, which is um, not so much descriptive of, of what they're witnessing as really uh, just signaling the context uh, for the departure uh, of Ireland. There wouldn't be that many songs um, coming from Ireland, as Gaelge, that would be um, overtly about uh, the famine. Um, but just in terms of the relationship between JJ and uh, Father Dan, this is the Reverend Murphy's own copy of Ungoyal. And you can see that he has identified the various contributions to the journal um, that came from Lyons. So it's demonstrating his respect for Lyons's work. In other words, they have an eye to a particular standard uh, in relation to the song transcriptions and uh, spelling in, in Irish, etc. cetera. Um, there's an interesting point that I may as well make it now as make it later. Um, they, they, at the time, Irish wouldn't have been uh, fully standardized. And given that they were transcribing songs from uh, different uh, parts of the country and different dialects of Irish, they tended toward a, sort of a faithful transcription of the pronunciation, even if that seemed to be a, a deviation of sorts or a, a little um, sort of uh, nuancing of the spelling 
just in order to reflect how the singers had performed it. So an interesting question in the practice of music collecting and more generally and, and folklore collecting indeed. So um, the, I suspect that it was uh, the Philo-Celtic Society specifically um, that uh, is, that's where JJ and Dan would have met. And uh, from the minute book and any of the references to their activities um, in the various uh, newspapers and journals, we can actually map the membership of the, uh, of the society. And so I get a sense of the Irish language community um, in downtown Philadelphia, um, because you can see their, their subscriptions would have been paid, that would have been noted in the minute book. And uh, we're getting uh, specific addresses at, at specific dates um, here. So again, being able to map individuals in time and space. So uh, Father Murphy, he um, is ordained in 1889 and he's first a uh, curate in uh, St. Teresa of Avila in just the south side of uh, downtown Philadelphia. And the, the church, this building doesn't stand anymore, um, but you can see on the map that it's marked there uh, with the uh, red cross and that Father Murphy is living just down the street from there and then four blocks away there's a singer uh, on Clymer Street there uh, a man named Thomas O'Clochertha and uh, O'Clochertha uh, contributed the first of the songs that I encountered from this collection and it just so happens that it's a song from my own native village in Arran from Kilivity uh, it's a song dating from the famine period and it's about proselytization or on Hamish and uh, this song uh, Murphy transcribed it from Thomas O'Clochertha around 1890 or so so he's you know he's he just met him as a parishioner presumably uh, just shortly after he's he's uh, sent there and uh, this was the first glimpse that I had of the collection and I was struck by the fact that you had a man who had been in America for 40 years, Thomas O'Clochertha, that he was able to remember a song, uh, in a very long song, 18 verses of it, and it's a very complicated one as well given how politicised the subject of proselytization would be, uh, but also I was remarking on Father Dan's uh, ability to transcribe it all in Irish and what looked to be very um, good Irish grammar wise, spelling wise, etc. And this was the um, glimpse, I suppose, that uh, set me on the path to searching for these manuscripts and then eventually um, finding them two years later. Uh, but when I encountered this, I was struck, as I say, by uh, O'Clochertha's remembering and somebody who, you know, that who can. Uh, I suppose, deliver in that context, you know, something so long and substantial. He's a candidate for uh, being a star informant. And when the collection then was revealed um, and the listing of it reveals that he had contributed over 40 songs to the collection. Now, he, that's not even the largest repertoire from a single singer. The largest one is actually from a man named um, uh, Liam O'Donnell from Rana Ferste, who contributed over 70 songs. So uh, just to give you an idea maybe of some of the songs here, because I, I know we'll have um, uh, singers and lovers of the song listening. Uh, Thomas here would have been singing Krishlan Gyor and Vinshin Luachra, Bohalin Zasogma and Sagratin and Sushin Bon and Tal Huach, Kurtitrahan Wee, Queen of Glach Sanoid. So lots of songs that we still hear today, but of course it'll be interesting to see what other songs survived in this collection and maybe haven't survived since uh, in Ireland. So when you see the scale of the repertoire here, for me, it prompts the question, where and when is he singing all of these songs? Is he just singing them for himself at home? Um, or are there occasions for it? And we have a glimpse here in a letter uh, that was sent as part of the Tuke scheme, the emigration scheme in the 1880s. And uh, I suspect that the, these people here are from Ackle Island, given that they ended up in Cleveland. Um, the chain migration routes there were, were well formed by then. But the description really gives us a, a glimpse of musical activity in a diasporic setting from Irish speakers, uh, we'll guess, given where they probably came from. So uh, the story goes, the night we landed in Cleveland, 
When we came to Martin's house, Bridget and Hugh did not know what to say when they saw us. We did not sleep any for two nights, but dancing and playing and everyone coming to see us. So I'm looking at this description and thinking that's a domestic setting. And I'm wondering, well, are there maybe more public settings for uh, song performances as Gaelga to be happening? And JJ describes one here where he says, um, the following song is very popular among the natives of Ulster in America. I often heard it sung at weddings and at christenings and other social gatherings in the city of Philadelphia. And it's written from the dictation of Mr. Con McNeilis, a native of the parish of Inniskeel, County Donegal. And he's singing Reik Charnseel or Shukran Charnseel, as it would also be called. And uh, this particular example for me is uh, demonstrating it's, it's public singing, but also it's, there are occasions for celebration, weddings and christenings. So, uh, this is uh, very uh, far from the descriptions that um, we've had previously um, of emigrants maybe leaving the language on the dockside at the point of arrival, which uh, seems to be a, a, an oversimplification uh, when we consider the, the scale of this particular story. So the description here from uh, Dennis Clark um, saying obtaining jobs, housing and the education needed for an urban environment left emigrants little time to recall or revive the use of the language which for many was their native tongue Gaelic becoming what he describes as a sort of a secret language and that you know for, uh, retained by a few who were often poor and bereft of formal education but that um, when we look at the detail of the collection uh, doesn't um, I suppose stand up to the evidence because here we have Thomas O'Clocher to whom I mentioned, and he actually owns the building uh, that he's living in and he's renting the back of it out to an English family. And, uh, you know, I, uh, he can't have been an exception, uh, even if the statistics do say that a third of the Philadelphia Irish at this time uh, would have been below the poverty line. So just, I think it's important to try and um, keep an eye to the, the nuances of, of these stories. Um, just uh, an example here of the, the effort to quantify the collection when it was moved uh, from America to Galway in 1936. Uh, the handwriting is that of Professor Thomas O'Moyle, who was the professor of Irish in Galway at the time. He was a folklore and song collector himself and also a publisher. So not surprising to find that he's at the receiving end of, of this uh, when it's uh, sent back to Ireland. But um, it's, I've just put up the numbers there to show you, they're, they're bundles, you know, when I opened the boxes first, they were, some of them were still wrapped up in paper and uh, brown paper and string, and the bundles had maybe 28, 27 songs on average through each one, so he's counting the parcels as he's going through the boxes and arriving at in and around over 1200 when, when we uh, list them, so there is an abundance of evidence in this collection that needs to be uh, assessed because the scale of it suggests that we can reconfigure uh, this cultural history for uh, Irish language speakers um, in the diasporic setting and just to um, as I say bring more nuance into the story instead of um, just the simplification of the minoritized language uh, that sort of um, hopeless depiction uh, of it just instantly being redundant. We understand, of course, that it wasn't redundant. It was serving a purpose, a very strong one for the people that held on to scores of songs uh, throughout their lives. Um, just to give you an idea maybe of some of these songs, we have one here, uh, Mali Mahoud Vila Gro. This is from Liam O'Donnell and Rana Ferste. And just a note at, uh, to look at the, maybe the, the process of collecting. Uh, this looks to be maybe an early maybe even the first run of writing it down, if not the, the second one, but it's handwritten. And then it's followed by a typed version. So typing it up, uh, probably to prepare it for publication in one of the journals. And you'll note that it is a Gaelge typewriter. And the uh, Father Murphy had one of the first ever of, of the Gaelge typewriters that came on the market, because of course they were produced in America and he had it by February 1892 and uh, he, along with the verses of the song he's also giving 
uh, the context to go with it. So explaining where the singer is from and then what we call Uder Onoran, the authority of, of the song, the explanation of where it came from. So um, uh, the inclusion of this additional context is uh, important because while there, sometimes folkloric sources can be depicted as being um, maybe um, sort of difficult to pin down or nebulous in some way, uh, that uh, really doesn't uh, convey the degree of effort in trying to um, confirm and uh, authorize and authenticate uh, what it is that's being uh, written down. In, in fact, the, the, the fact that it is oral um, demands a, a, a faithfulness to the context uh, as well to be sure uh, that it survives intact uh, from one uh, generation to the next. So a lot of effort uh, going into this, as you can see with all of the um, editing that's going on with it, or I should say uh, revising uh, rather than editing. So um, here's uh, just uh, more examples of the uh, kinds of uh, material that make up the collection physically, whether you have the um, minute book surviving from the society meetings, the transcriptions that are handwritten or that are typed, and looking at uh, the pages of Ungail, there is such an amount of marginalia throughout this uh, series that, uh, of the journal that Father Murphy owned, that really it, it forms an integral part of the manuscript collection, uh, that both of them should be uh, treated as one entity in a way, uh, because he's uh, referring back to uh, maybe contributions from other um, collectors or, or submissions that were printed therein. And there's a dialogue um, throughout the, the collection. So if we can retain uh, all of this uh, context along with sort of each individual artifact or page, uh, that's really where it's helping us to address our problems like discoverability and accessibility, because uh, um, a lot of uh, some sources can be developed in isolation. And uh, with this one, the scale of it demands that we actually consider um, more widely uh, what are the potentials to link it with other uh, resources. So um, towards the end of, well, it's not, it's not the end really. What we have here is um, there's sort of a, a turning point in some ways. 1898, here is uh, Murphy in the hospital in Philadelphia. And he may very well have been a patient because he certainly wasn't a hospital chaplain or anything like that. It's no record to suggest that. And uh, he's still engaged in his um, um, song collecting scholarship uh, from his hospital bed. Um, but what happens is that from about uh, 1902 onwards, he, he, he's, he's on sick leave um, after this stay, we'd say. And he kind of goes off grid. We're not really sure um, what he does. He doesn't have a parish. Uh, so still a bit of mystery around that, but he, he turns up here and there in the correspondence and you can see he's living in the poorer parts of Philadelphia. Um, but he maintains the scholarship and the network that he has here. He's in correspondence with Thorna in Cork, with um, Douglas Hyde. And uh, there's, there's song material, you know, that sometimes you'll get not quite a, a duplication, but there, there are um, materials that are shared between collectors as well. And they turn up in, in uh, the separate collections, we we'll would say. Uh, but another of the correspondence is uh, Owen McNeil when he was editing Edith Darren O'Gailge. And this is interesting here because he's talking about, um, he's just given him uh, a song that maybe uh, stretches the boundaries of uh, morality in some way uh, because he finds himself um, giving a, a sort of an instruction to the, ed to the editor, Owen McNeil, saying, if you believe the words in them, in the songs, are too obscene to be propagated, you can replace them with more appropriate words. If you're compiling a Gaelic dictionary, you ought to have every word there is in Irish, be it good or bad. And this is significant because there were other priests that were collectors who sometimes uh, edited uh, morally questionable verses or words or lines out of songs. So um, to see Murphy um, revealing a, a sort of a, a degree of loyalty to the 
text as is, um, is interesting and uh, that he's not superimposing any uh, of his, I suppose, clerical uh, role on, uh, on the material. Towards the end of his life, he is in Villanova University working with various manuscripts. And by now, JJ has been, has been dead for a, a good while, I would say. I haven't uh, got his dates pinned down yet, but um, he has an assistant uh, helping him out, a man named Thomas de Roche, a younger man, uh, born in County Clare in 1872. And there are some interesting letters that Thomas wrote that give us some insight into this um, Irish language collecting or manuscript activity, writing things down. And just to give you a flavor, I think these are nice. He says, um, he says, I'm busy. He's writing to um, Sean McCraw back in Ireland, a man whom he hasn't met, but they're corresponding about books and manuscripts and things. And he says, I'm busy besides all this work of copying old Gaelic manuscripts, answering and sending letters. I work as an engineer in charge of one of Philadelphia's leading hotels, eight hours a day, seven days a week, I enjoy the Gaelic side of my work and I would be lost without it. So there's concrete evidence there of somebody explaining uh, the conviction of, of living with uh, this uh, material. And he says uh, elsewhere, he says, within the past year, I have copied 4,000 lines of Gaelic from old manuscripts and mailed it to different parts of the world. About the middle of August, I had to stop on account of the terrible heat. And really 1930, this is quite late really to be looking at um, what, really it looks uh, strikingly similar to the manuscript tradition from an earlier period in Ireland. But of course, this is the very, very tail end of it because um, around this time, um, Father Michael O'Flanagan was able to visit them in Philadelphia and to actually, I won't say photograph, but he had some sort of device to scan the manuscripts that they had uh, spent so much time retranscribing and, and distributing copies to people that were seeking them. Um, but life changes then around the time of the Wall Street crash um, and uh, it's obviously getting harder. So just another little glimpse here of when and how he's engaging in all of this activity. He says, I do all my writing at night time. That is my spare time. I work from 12 to 8 a.m., get a few hours sleep, get up around 7 o'clock p.m., take a bath and after a light breakfast start on the old manuscripts. I leave home every night at 11 p.m. and return at 9 a.m. So you can figure out how little time I have. I don't read newspapers or magazines except Gaelic ones. I look over the Irish world for a half hour every week and then mail it to my schoolmate and friend of my early days, uh, Thomas Hines in Killina. Hines was a uh, timider and a photographer and he actually used to take photographs and passport photos as well for immigrants that were going to America. So, um, uh, just uh, I'll be uh, drift, coming towards the end of, of my talk here, we have <clears throat> just a quick glimpse of the uh, teaching activity, the teaching of Irish that Father Murphy and Thomas de Rosa did together in Philadelphia, where he says that um, uh, they that we went from house to house giving lessons. This is in the city of Philadelphia. And oftentimes uh, we met with insults. We are not politicians. If we were we would be more respected. So um, a glimpse there of the, I suppose, the other side of people not particularly interested in uh, maintaining or retaining or acquiring Irish as well. So again, adding to that more nuanced uh, picture. Um, Father Dan then uh, dies in 1935. There is now a headstone over him and I'm sure a photograph will um, emerge, I suppose, after restrictions are, are um, uh, re relieved somewhat. Um, but after Father Murphy died, there was no will and Thomas de Roche uh, managed to uh, persuade uh, those that were left uh, in the States that the collection ought to be sent back to Ireland. 1935 is the middle of the Great Depression. He, he's sort of um, confirming that there wouldn't be any monetary value in these um, folders and uh, manuscript materials and thankfully all of it ended up um, in NUI Galway uh, as I say where uh, Thomas Lamola then uh, interacted uh, with the collection um, for a short time before he died and then World War II breaks out so the memory around the collection uh, faded and that's how come it took so long I suppose for the um, for the collection to re-emerge again uh, when 
I moved to Galway and was working with music collecting specifically. I, I was tracing uh, those kinds of activities. So now we're at the stage that we'd like to maybe generate a resource that everybody can access, whether they're on this side or the Atlantic or the other or anywhere for that matter. And here is just a very early prototype website to give you a sense of maybe how that might function, that you might be able to look at it from the, um, from, you know, where they've come from, as well as where they're arriving into. But given the scale of and the detail of this collection, really, it's quite exciting to imagine how we could trace more and more of these, because we know that Irish memories are long and that it's possible to uh, identify individuals back into the 19th century. Um, I've done it from my own relatives going back to sources from 200 years ago. So um, uh, I know that this would uh, certainly appeal. And of course, there's also the potential then to link these in with other resources that are, are available already and that are growing. And just one example for you um, uh, here, the uh, uppermost one from Dugan is uh, the Royal Irish Academies project. And below then is from uh, the National Folklore Collection in, in UCD. But, it's the same individual that features in those two different recordings, a man named uh, Porrick McMenamin. And in the Murphy collection, there's a lady called Bridget McMenamin. They're both from Ballycroy. They're around the same vintage. And I wonder maybe are they siblings? Are they cousins? And we get to maybe look at uh, their, um, their memory, their performances, their uh, songs and uh, folklore and maybe see how those are carried on, on both sides of the Atlantic and at the same in the same time period. So a uh, very uh, tantalizing uh, example there. Um, but also even, um, you know, to, to expand that out and look at other sources apart from the very well known ones of the National Folklore Collection. Uh, Beaver Island in uh, Lake Michigan uh, in the late 19th century had a huge number of Aranmore Islanders from County Donegal. And a lot of them uh, had actually pit stopped in Pennsylvania and gone to Beaver Island or maybe come back. So uh, I, I've been speaking with colleagues in, in the States around the possibility of um, tracing some of those connections because there were uh, folklore collections produced um, in Beaver Island, just uh, one example there, the Helen Collar papers. So um, another story that would be interesting to explore because um, even though the, the manuscripts themselves um, sort of post-stated the whole story of the Molly Maguires is significant because the, the singers that are featured could very well have uh, lived through and witnessed uh, that particular period in um, northeastern Pennsylvania's uh, history. So, um, and the Irish language, of course, playing a, a very uh, interesting role in, in that whole uh, story. Uh, and then a little bit later, we have George Corson's work uh, in Pennsylvania with the anthracite miners there. And again, looking at the folklore, it's if you don't get material in Irish, but there are certainly Irish people uh, coming through that. So another uh, interesting point of comparison. And just to uh, the last point I guess I want to make about Father Murphy is um, to highlight a, a particular potential uh, that it has, um, a unique potential perhaps. Uh, what I'm showing you here are three books of, um, I suppose, song indices uh, that you can um, uh, look at for all of uh, South County Galway. Um, three different volumes pertaining to uh, different baronies. And uh, these are like um, phone books, I'm showing my age and saying that, uh, that you can look up a song and, and a verse and a line and, and uh, try and trace songs and find out a particular song text, well, which song matrix does it fit into. And uh, these are the only three uh, relating to the National Folklore Collection that are currently available to the best of my knowledge. And uh, Delargy, James Delargy of the National Folklore Collection had talked about the need to index the songs uh, in order to enable the scholarship. So, you know, he was making that point back in 1940. And I would argue that now we have a collection that can actually enable that because the Murphy collection is catalogued. Father Murphy had his own series of catalog numbers for the songs. And then later, Thomas Samuele, when he received the manuscripts, he applied another series of catalogue numbers. So a bit like Harvard's own Francis James Child and the Child Ballads, we could have something similar for Shannon's song uh, with this particular collection because of the scale of it and the detail and uh, the 
I suppose the effort and in the accuracy and just to even demonstrate that here you'll see this uh, uh, really interesting page just for the um, orthography we've got a uh, different colored typewriter ribbon and two different typewriters on the go to generate this uh, sort of contents list for a particular um, bound copy of Ungail that Father Murphy had. So um, the ambition at this point now is to try and launch a project that can uh, do justice to the um, commitment and conviction of the creators, they being the collectors that did the transcribing, um, or all of the 450 singers from counties all along the Western seaboard in Ireland uh, that I suppose put their faith in us to carry their memories uh, forward into the future. So um, I'll wrap it up there and uh, invite questions that you may have. Um, you're welcome to put them in the chat there and uh, we'll, uh, I, I look forward to um, to those questions and uh, because I always learn from them as well. So thanks very much for the opportunity to share this story with you and go merry meet you and I'm sure east. So thank you. Gurumila mila mila mahat a year that was just fantastic. I think that there are going to be a lot of questions. I think that deserves a humongous round of applause. Um, it is, it is so fascinating to see how much material is out there in archives, in some, in some respects, just waiting to be discovered. And your point about cataloging the songs uh, from, from, from one amateur cataloger to another, I think is wonderful uh, and absolutely needs to be done.